Hello, I'm Aaron Perbone. This is Game Journals and Network. Joining me for a special interview is Allison Tiemann of the Honey Badge Brigade. Hi. Hi. So we have a lot of interesting news uh, going on this week. Um, originally, we wanted to bring you on so we can talk about Canadian politics with your new prime minister, and I hope I'm saying this right, Justin uh, Trudeau? Trudeau. Trudeau, okay. We were originally going to talk about that, but uh, this uh, actually yesterday we had a little bit of uh, some kind of breaking news on the Game Brigade front, which was... South by Southwest canceling two uh, panels, uh, both speaking about Gamergate in some way, shape, or form. Both canceled because of threats, actually. Um, we were wondering, what were your thoughts on that? Uh, since you have experience with, uh, unfortunately, uh, issues with conventions. Um, well, I think it's bad. Um, I, I actually was wondering if... Uh, I, I don't know how the pol all of the intricacies of the politics, but I was wondering if... Um, social justice warriors and, and anti-gamer gators would actually cancel their own panels in order to prevent Gamergate from speaking. I don't know if that's what happened in this instance, but I was thinking that that would be a possibility. Um, I, at, at the moment, I think that it's a little bit of a, it, to me it seems like a bit of a hairball, so uh, I don't know if um, Randy was, uh, was threatened first, and that's why they pulled her panel. And then Gamer, the Gamergate panel was threatened, and then it got pulled, and uh, South by Southwest just threw up the tens and said, we can't deal with this nonsense. Um, so uh, if, do, do, you, do, you have a, do you have a rundown on, on what, what the, the sequence of events were? And maybe I could give a better, better comment on it. Because it, well, it seems like there's a lot of stories. Yeah, it's, it's, it's still constantly growing, and, and that's kind of a big problem with breaking news kind of level-headed um what we did confirm though however uh yesterday uh we had john smith uh actually interview uh the head of the op games of the open uh, gaming society and the open gaming society didn't receive any threats personally the organizers didn't personally receive any threats south by southwest uh had a lot of uh had some threats uh thrown towards them uh randy harper mentioned on twitter that she had threats uh sent to her but we can't confirm or deny those um, the only ones we can confirm were from South by Southwest because they made it abundantly clear that they did have that. There was concerns over safety, and uh, the people organizing the gaming aspect of South by Southwest canceled both panels out of uh, concern and safety. Um, so I that, do know that, that's what can happen. That's, so I've, I've heard, happened. in addition to that, there's been a whole bunch of uh, media outlets that have reported that game, been blaming Gamergate for this. Right, which which is unfortunately. Uh, which is kind of interesting because, like, you know, I don't even know uh, how they can really blame. I, I can understand why they're blaming uh, Gamergate, and I can and I can also not understand why they're blaming Gamergate at the same time, unfortunately. Well, they're blaming Gamergate because they're, it's a convenient scapegoat. Yeah. To. <laughs> Again, that's the, under, that's the understanding. And then it's just, it's just, you know, kind of one of those situations where, you know, there is no definite proof, and, you know, it's been kind of one of those things where, you know, how, how do you blame something of this magnitude like that, you know, and, you know, especially for a group that's actually trying to have an event here, it kind of doesn't make any sense, but then again, at the same time, it kind of goes back to, to what you mentioned uh, just a couple moments ago, which was, you know, possibility that Antis could want to do that, or if they do do that, you know. You know uh, well, what's, what's remarkable to me is how they can blame Gamergate when, I mean, if you look at motivation, usually you have to find motivation to really, to really have a case against for, for blaming a person for, or a group of people. This platform is one of the few platforms that Gamergate has in the greater society. This, this, is, a, this is a platform that Gamergate had. Um, the aggros, the, the anti-Gamergators and the social justice warriors have the very platforms that are blaming Gamergate for this. Why would Gamergate take away its only platform when it went, or one of its few platforms, <laughs> why would they take that away? Why would they take away their, one of the few platforms that Gamer Gators have to speak on? Um, and if you look at the other side, they have a multitude of platforms. Sacrificing one to, to silence Gamergate is not, it, it's not going to be, it's not going to jeopardize their ability to get their message out there. Because obviously, they're getting their anti-Gamergate sentiment out there right now. They're getting it out there by blaming Gamergate for taking away its one platform. I mean, it's like anti-Gamergators have 200 megaphones, 
and Gamergate has one. And the anti-Gamergaters can sacrifice one megaphone to get rid of Gamergate's one megaphone, and somehow Gamergate would get rid of their one megaphone. And, 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 and th how does that even make sense? I know we like to be, I, I know we like to reserve judgment, but how would it make sense for Gamergate to sacrifice its platform to get rid of one minor platform in the anti-Gamergate arsenal? It doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't make it, no, I do agree. It does not make any sense at all. It's especially like, you know, when you look at what they are trying to say, what they are trying to uh, push forward. And it's kind of weird because, you know, some if we, we I've asked Gamergators before, is there anything on the opposite side that you agree with? And a lot of people have said, you know, well, we do agree that there should be more representation of, you know, different characters in video gaming, uh, sexual orientation, uh, race or not. They don't, you know, that's something that they, they like, but, you know, then there's still that, you know, spin that they're trying to pull in some way, shape or form. And it's kind of weird that they would, like you said, sacrifice a smaller portion of their army, or I'm sorry, of their megaphones just to, you know, silence a bigger one. And we had the same thing with uh, AirPlay uh, a couple of months ago. Full disclosure, I was uh, in attendance and helping out and organizing a, a, another AirPlay. But it's interesting that that gets brought up because, you know, bomb threats were called in. You know, some people assumed it was anti, some people assumed it was uh, trolls in some way, shape, or form. But then the question becomes, why would A, Gamergate want to censor itself when this was its first live platform that um, was giving a voice to something that needed to happen, and at the same time, B, it was a uh, uh, it was a bomb threat on not necessarily a Gamergate panel. A lot of people assume that this whole event was surrounded about Gamergate. When you actually were uh, like people who were actually there, they will tell you that this was not exclusively a Gamergate conference. It was a ethics and journalism conference that was talking about other issues, ironically not including Gamergate. Yeah. Well, like I said, why would why would Gamergate sacrifice its only platform to to nullify the social justice warriors when, and, and anti Gamergaters when we know that they can just turn to the media right and and have their voice heard? I mean, it's 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 beyond it's it's stupid. You'd have to you'd have to believe that Gamergaters as a whole are complete morons to 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 believe that they did this and it's it's i mean at that point in time it's like yeah maybe third party trolls did it but the motive there to silence i mean there's this motive since the beginning from anti gamers gators to silence gamer gators and sacrificing one small platform to make sure that gamergate has no platform whatsoever that that's t entirely in line with sacrificing the message of Gamergate, and and sacrificing their only platform to try to silence one of the minor platforms in the anti-Gamergate um, uh, arsenal doesn't make any sense at all. It 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 it's 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 shooting yourself in the foot. <laughs> no, it's completely under it's completely understandable. I mean, it it makes no sense at all whatsoever. Um, that being said, um, you know, if everything's been going on with this, um, any updates on, on your guys' side with uh, Calgary Festival? I mean, because uh, a lot of people, um, you know, uh, first of all, you know, you have Honey Badger Radio, and you've been uh, talking about a lot, of, a lot of interesting things on Honey Badger Radio, uh, not just about Gamergate, uh, men's rights activism, and uh, happenings in the gaming culture as well. But uh, Honey Badger Brigade uh, got some notoriety not too long ago, about, um, I want to say nine months ago or six months ago, I could be wrong about that timing, um, when you were kicked out of Calgary Fest because you spoke at a Gamergate, you, you spoke up at a Gamergate panel, you were in attendance at a Gamergate panel. Actually, um, actually let, me just, let's just wait, let me correct you there. Okay. okay. We originally, I originally was going to go to the Calgary Expo, um, the Calgary Comics and Entertainment Expo, which is listed under calgaryexpo.com. Right. I was originally going to go there um, to show my comic book. But then a bunch of, uh, we, we did a fundraiser to see if we could get the rest of the honey badgers there. And uh, so uh, when the fundraiser was successful, I updated the name of the booth to Honey Badger Brigade. Um, I did that with the the event uh, the uh, the exhibitor exhibi uh, exhibition coordinator who already knew 
who I was because I had exhibited from uh, in a um, in a uh, in a convention the previous uh, September, like in 2014, in September under Honey Badger Radio. So he already knew the connection. So the the updating the booth name was merely a formality. Um, and uh, so I updated the booth name. They they put it all on the placards and and we went and because part of the funding was done through Gamer Gators, some Gamer Gators stepped up to help us get there. Um, I decided to put the Gamergate logo on sort of a, 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 fat, a, a flag. And um, it was a flag that was uh, stand against censorship with the with our with our badger uh, badger character on it, and then also the Gamergate um, Gamergate uh, logo with uh, ethics in in journalism. And um, and so we put that up uh, on our booth to sort of honor the fact that Gamergators helped get us there, in addition to our own usual audience. And um, and and then on the Thursday, well, actually on. The Thursday morning before the convention opened, Hannah overheard uh, uh, one of the convention staff and some women that she didn't identify saying that they had to shut some booths down and they gestured towards ours, but Hannah wasn't didn't know for sure if it was a joke or if it was serious or um, if they were actually intending to include ours in the gesture if it was just a general gesture. So she went back and we, we talked about this. We approached the convention organizers and uh, they, they, there was a there was a um, uh, a customer service desk directly across from our our booth. We approached them and asked them, is everything okay? Um, are, are any of the materials that we're displaying, is there a problem with them? They said no. And then we went back to our booth, um, thinking that it was resolved. And uh, later that day, I decided with my friend Sage Gerard, who was there to help me sell my comic in a volunteer capacity. He's not actually part of Honey Badger Brigade. He was there solely in a volunteer capacity as my friend to help me sell my comic. And me and him went to uh, uh, a uh, comics... Um, if, uh, a comic panel called Women Into Comics. Right. When we read the summary, there was no indication anything like a safe space or anything. It was just a discussion on women into comics. So I went there, and um, when the uh, organizers, who pretty much were obviously feminist, all of them, uh, referenced men's rights activists and asked, why do men's rights activists dislike feminists or this situation? I, st I stood up and I said, may I speak? And they said, yes. And then I said, as a men's rights activist, and then and they said, okay, uh, this is this is what I think. I, I, I don't like feminism because it presents, um, it presents women as victims, and I think that's damaging to women, um, and it fails to acknowledge men's vulnerabilities, which I believe is important because it gives context to this idea that women are defined as victims. And uh, and then and there was a I, there was an audio recording of this and yeah there's an audio recording of yeah, this and and I've heard the audio recording multiple times and when you asked this question there was no inflection I can tell there was no inflection in your voice um, you asked it as a standard question you know you weren't you weren't loud you weren't I mean you, you were probably projecting so they can hear you from like you know wherever you were standing um, but it didn't seem like you were attacking them it didn't seem like you were aggressively asking this question no. No, um, and I, I would also add that because the recording device was close to us, it sounded louder than we actually were. Right. It's audio is funny like that, but but we but from the tone of your voice, it didn't seem like you know you were you were angry, you weren't yelling at them or anything like that. You you asked the standard question um, at this panel, um, and immediately afterwards, uh, what happened? Well, it wasn't immediately afterwards. Um, okay. We went back. Um, we started to hear rumblings from the Mary Sue, uh, specifically the editor in the Mary Sue that um, I found out later resigned in July. Um, and uh, so we we did a uh, a panel we did a, um, a hangout in which we were discussing some of the stuff that the Mary Sue was saying, and um, and then the next morning um, we went back, and uh, it was it was pretty ominous because we were hearing tweets from the previous night to the next morning that something was going to happen. So we, and we had to go back to, to figure out what was going to happen. Um, 
that was a really awful experience walking up those steps. Um, and so we, we went back to the booth and a few minutes in, and actually by that time we had to have, we had to actually take down the Gamergate flag. And it wasn't because anybody approached us to tell us to take it down. It was because our booth neighbors who hadn't received word or didn't know when the, when the, or there was some miscommunication, that booth had been empty. Um, and by the time we got back, they had put out all of their stuff um, and covered the, the Gamergate flag. So we had to take it, we took it down because it was no longer being, nobody could see it. Um, and that was when we were approached by uh, Shane Hinkleman, who was one of the security people at the expo. And he told me, and I had, I was still recording. Was, uh, you know, it seemed at that point to be hostile territory, but I was still recording. And he told me that he would tell us why we're being told to leave off record. Okay. And, and, um, so I, I gave my recorder to, to Hannah we started to move with him and he said only her, um, only Allison uh, or only her, only her, only her can come. And I asked, can, can my husband come with me? And he relented on that. And so they took us aside to a corner. There were about uh, two security, um, uh, Hinkleman and, uh, another female, um, uh, member of staff in the expo and he told me that w we they had received um i don't know however many 25 um messages on twitter indicating that i don't know we were horrible people and uh and also the, our behavior at the panel um so we would have to leave and uh we were told that we would have to pack up and get out uh, before the doors opened, which gave us at that at that point in time when when uh, Sean was speaking, we had about half an hour. Uh, by the time everything sort of played out, uh, we had about fifteen minutes to get everything down and out. Um, we had uh, we had no help. Um, and by no help, I mean nobody brought us a cart. We didn't know how we were going to get this stuff to our car because our car, the, the, the convention grounds are huge. So there's like a couple miles and this is, this was a heavy, heavy installation. Uh, it took me, I think three to five hours. I don't know specifically to put up. So it's a, it was a, it was a job to put up. It was a job to tear down and it was heavy. Um, and when were you asked to uh, take down uh, your booth? When? What, uh, what day? Uh, uh, it, was it was a Friday. Friday. It was so a Friday. The Thursday sort of pre-show, then they had the Friday show, and we were asked to take it down before the show The show opened on Friday. Now, were you asked to do this during, uh, like, with people in the uh, artist alley or a vendor's room, wherever you were located? Yeah. So I would assume there was probably uh, a heavy traffic flow already. No, at that point in time, there was nobody because it hadn't opened. The doors hadn't opened. Okay. But – we weren't able to get it all out in time because I mean, it was impossible task and we didn't, we hadn't brought the tools necessary to take down the exhibit. So it was, um, yeah, it was a, it was a pretty, uh, pretty uncomfortable experience. And then the, the, the security guards were, were hovering, um, around us like uh, almost uh, Hannah says that it was like they were thinking we were going to do something like they had been told that we were some kind of trouble. Um, <laughs> uh, so we just had to, we had to try to get this, the, uh, my, my exhibition or my installation down without tools in 15 minutes and no cart. Eventually I broke down um, and started to cry. And then uh, the security guards backed off and they got us a cart and they allowed us to move our car into the, into the loading ramp that was close by. Okay. Um, and you also got into a little bit of trouble because the following day, um, you and a bunch of other people met outside the convention off, off site on public grounds. Um, I believe across the street from where the convention was being held. Uh, just to have a conversation with people you guys well, had a a lot of people sources. had come from very far away to come and talk to us and meet with us um so we were trying to figure out how to accommodate them so we decided on a public park that was across the road from the calgary expo now across the road i don't mean it was like 
like immediately across the road. You would have to walk about five minutes to even get to the to the opening, like the the doors of the Calgary Expo. Right. So it was not. It was not. It was. It was convenient because their transit. Oh, um, transit opened up close to the public park. Um, so you'd still have to walk like quite a ways from that transit stop to get to the Calgary Expo, but it was. It, but it was close to the transit stop. Um, we didn't get in trouble. The Calgary, it wasn't, I don't think it was the first day that we did it. We did it the first and the second day. So we, if the Friday was a wash, but we did it the Saturday and the Sunday. I wasn't there on the Saturday. On the Sunday, there was a, a, a like about 50, 60 people who decided to come and meet up with us. Um, and we were sitting on the, on the grass and, and eating like cheese sticks. And, um, and uh, the Calgary Expo called the cops on us. Um, we had gathered on on the lawn to take a picture as well, and then um, and then we we were dispersed and just just hanging out and talking. Um, we hadn't done anything wrong, and when the cops came by, he said, "You seem like a nice group of people." After talking, inquiring about us and what we were doing, he said, "You seem like a nice group of people. Carry on." So there was no, we were not any trouble. Like we didn't get into trouble. Calgary Expo called cops on us. Okay, and right now you have a, a, a mounting legal case against them. What's the current status of that? What can you uh, uh, mention now, as of this moment? Well, as of this moment, um, all right. Well, we have we have filed um, uh, with it, it has it has been served out of the provincial court of Canada. Um, our claim, we are suing Calgary Expo for breach of concept, contract and injurious falsehood. For those of you who don't know, injurious falsehood is when people advance a falsehood that actually harms someone's business dealings, um, which Calgary Expo has done, uh, well, I guess allegedly, I can't, it, it, the court will decide, but um, so that's what we are suing for. And we're also suing for injurious falsehood and breach of con uh, incitement to breach of contract with the Mary Sue. Um, when we filed the the um, the documents, the Calgary Expo had 25 days to respond. The Calgary uh, the Mary Sue had 47 days to respond. Um, right now, um, we have actually received a response from the Calgary Expo. And finally, we have received a response. I have sent multiple letters to the um, to uh, emails, letters to the president of the Calgary Expo. We finally received a response. Uh, it was a little bit of a while back, but we wanted to do a bit more research before we revealed that this had happened. So this is the first time I've actually spoken about it in public. They have essentially said, this is their defense. Their defense is, they didn't do it, um, or rather the entity that we identified, because part, part of the reason why it took so long to file the documents is we had to do a registry search. We did a registry search on every single name that Calgary Expo apparently does business under. And what we found, the only, only registered business we could find was Calgary Interna Expo International, whose director is one Candix, or Kendrix Fong. Kendrick Fong is the founder of the Calgary Comics and Entertainment Expo. He owns the website that Calgary Comics and Entertainment Expo does business under, and he's been listed as the events coordinator since the beginning of Calgary Comics and Entertainment Expo. He is the director of Calgary Expo International, who is saying that they are not responsible for the Calgary Comics and, Inter uh, Calgary Comics and Entertainment Expo. Fair enough. We have now sent a letter to them saying who is responsible. Right, um, and as someone who's uh, worked at a lot of conventions, I can understand uh, what's been going on, on that end because sometimes you know you have one person in charge of one convention group and he's in charge of other convention groups under that group, and it's uh, the convention scene is very large in that sense. It's uh, you know, but strange. But um, I no, I, I mean this is this is this is more than just the confusion about. Um, this particular individual is listed. When you do a who is on the on the website, Calgary Expo, right, listed as the owner and and the administrator of that website. 
He's also the founder of Calgary Comics and Entertainment Expo. So he know he sh he should if he's the founder and he and he owns the a website that they do business under, he should know who is responsible if it's not them. So we've sent a letter saying, please inform us of who is responsible. We do not want to cause any harm or any difficulty to responsible. Um, in addition to saying the defense that they are not responsible, the Calgary Expo International lawyers have also said that if they were, even though they are not responsible, they were in the right to do it. Okay. So the, the reason why they do that, uh, lawyers can argue in the alternative. It's if it's if and when their defense that it, they aren't responsible crumbles, they can continue with a defense that they were right to do it. If they don't introduce that defense now, they can uh, they 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 won't be able to introduce it later. Okay. So if, it, if it's found out that they are indeed the ones responsible, if they don't introduce the defense that they were right to do it, then they can't argue that in court. Okay. So okay. that's where we're at. Do you? We have sent a, well. We have sent a letter to to the Calgary um, Entertainment Ex, uh, inter, inter, in, Calgary Expo International, asking them or telling them to please inform us of who is. And uh, uh, Harry Capico informs me that if they do not reply, because it, the 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 mountain of evidence is there that that Kendrick's Fong knows who is responsible for the Calgary Comics and Entertainment Expo, if they don't reply, it's going to look really bad. Right, and you guys are in an interesting situation because outside of uh, Aaron uh, Aaron Droney's uh, case with. Uh, um, with Zoe Quinn, uh, you would you would be the second group to go to court over something Gamergate related, and that's kind of a a, a, a big step forward for like some people. Like some would say it's a big step forward. Some people will say this is a um, too much of a step forward. What, how, how do you feel about that? Too much of a step forward? Uh, like um, I don't know why I'm using the wrong term there, but like you know, some people are saying, oh, this is a good step forward. Some people are saying like this is a step in the wrong direction. I should have said. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to try to be polite. This is my life. Right. This is something that hurt my life. Like I put, I put the, the banner up. I said that I, I, I politely asked to speak and I've been accused of harassing. I've had my name dragged through the mud in the comics, um, industry. They've basically torched my ability to go out and talk to people face to face. So they've torched the real, um, the frat, the the real life or the the in person aspect of my ability to to sell my comic book. I I, I can still, but this is my life. Um, and admittedly, I made the choice. I didn't want to necessarily succeed in a society where people could be silenced in this way. They were terrified coming up to our booth. They were shaking in fear. This is not healthy. This is not a good position to be in. Convention shouldn't be scared to speak. They shouldn't be scared to come up to someone's booth and speak to them. That's not what they're about, to, to create this kind of atmosphere of fear um, and tension. And so I didn't I, I was willing to put up the Gamergate logo because I wanted to take a stand to make sure for to, to make, ensure free speech and, a, and an atmosphere, a welcoming atmosphere in conventions for everyone, not just people who tow a particular party line, a particular ideology. And this <laughs> because of that, I was made an example of. So to the people who think that this is going too far, I don't think it's their call. I, I, this is this is not maybe you don't want to make the decision to stand up for free, free speech to start saying hey, this is too far people artists shouldn't be afraid convention goers shouldn't be afraid fans shouldn't be afraid they shouldn't be afraid of censorship and they shouldn't be afraid of this silent silent angry f tension that's that's now in these com these conventions because of these issues being brought there like Fine, if you don't want to have that fight, that's fine. 
but to pass judgment. I don't know. It's, it's like okay. personally, um, personally, like at, at, at this point, in terms of the web, in terms of the lawsuit, um, personally, I'm going forward because of what was done to me because of this. And I know that they'll do this to anybody else who speaks out. So they're trying to make an example of me. They're trying to say, this is what happens when you speak out. They did, did that with Aaron. Um, they, you know, they do that with- Gag order and everything, yeah. They do that with the sad puppies, but they didn't quite do it in a way that, that necessarily um, Brad Turgeson can have a, a recourse. They did it with Terrell. They do it with all kinds of people. They, they, this bullying and making an example of, and nobody wants to step out and say, hey, stop. Nobody wants to put anything on the line to tell them that this is not behavior that you engage in, especially in a creative and, and, and innovative field. This is supposed to be about exploring every idea, understanding all kinds of different points of view, not just one narrow point of view. What, what is the point of Gamergate if it's not to reclaim these spaces for create, creative people and to, to, to fight back against censorship, to fight back against the ethical breaches in journalism that are creating these problems? Because most of this, most of what happened to me was because journalists didn't fact check, didn't do the least amount of fact checking. They just took a story and ran with it. And... This is like, I can't, fine, if you don't want to step up and do it, fine. But to say I'm wrong for stepping up and doing it, to say the people who stepped up with me, to say that Aaron's wrong, this is Aaron's life. This is, this is Brad Turgeson's life. I'm, I don't understand. Like, at some point, you got to step up and say this is wrong. And if you're not the kind of person who can do that, fine. Sit where you are. But why cast Chuck willing to do it? Okay. No, it's it's fine. Um, it's. Um, do you need a moment, or I mean? No, I'm good. I'm good. It's just. Uh, okay. All right. Well, um, with everything that's happened with you uh, at uh, uh, Calgary Fan Fest, and um, and knowing about Gamergate beforehand, and after that, what happened? Has your view on Gamergate uh, changed? Gotten stronger? Or anything of that, anything of that like. Honestly, it's gotten it's gotten stronger. Um, I think if if I were to say something about about Gamergate, when the first day it was so peaceful at the convention, I was like, why? I was actually questioning. I, so I can understand why they say don't do it. I was actually questioning. You know, why am I bringing this conflict here? Why am I doing this? What is the poor point of this? And, and and it it would become a moot point because the, the the poster would be covered up if if the other people on the other booth came that poster would have been covered up the next day anyway, so I was like you know is is this the right thing to do because I'm always asking myself that is this the right thing to do. But then they made an example of me, and the people that came with me that I brought there, and I realized that this is a fight that needs to happen. People shouldn't be scared in these communities. People shouldn't be scared in the gamer community. People shouldn't be scared in the science fiction community. People shouldn't be scared in all of these geek communities. These people, these individuals, these aggros, these, these social justice warriors are coming in and they are bringing fear and authoritarianism into these communities. And they are getting everywhere. They're in the freaking UN. So they're going to bring it to the internet. They're going to bring that fear and authoritarianism to the internet. And they're going to kill what, what was created, the freedom, the first totally free, totally free space. And they are going to try to destroy it. And they're going to bring that fear and authoritarianism into these free spaces. They're not going to stop because nobody stands up to them because everybody's afraid of being made an example of. And when that happened, I realized that, yes, this is a fight that needs to happen that we need to stand up and that Gamergate is vitally important, not, not for ethical journalism, because a lot of these, a lot of these situations, a lot of the scapegoating, a lot of the making an example of is done through journalism. It's done through this network of, of, of 
uh, cronyism, of like nepotism, this network of, of journalists who are sucking each other's asses. They're mouth to ass. They're like the journalist human centipede. And the and this is this is the this is the tool, this is the instrument, this is the weapon of the kind of aggression that these people are are putting is journalism. So ethics and journalism, the idea that journalists don't just follow a narrative, but are responsible for checking their facts, for being honest and logical and reasoned, and just reporting the facts, not making shit up and, and, and then repeating shit that's been made up by another journalist over and over and over again. That is so important. That is so important. Like the Games journalism, ethics in games in, in games journal, ethics in journalism, period, is the fight. Maybe, maybe gamers didn't want that fight, but it was the fight that wanted them. Because this is the community that stood up and fought back. This is the community that are creating the connections, that creating the the the, the new way of distributing information that could have a possible Snowball's chance in hell of actually combating what journalists are doing, what, what the old networks of journalists, the corruption in the old networks of journalism, no longer care about facts. I mean, any one of those journalists who reported on me being, the, I don't know, the, the second coming of Hitler could have listened to what happened at that panel, could have found the audio of that panel and realized that there was no, no harassment. There, there was a discussion. It was maybe, I mean, I, to be honest, I get heated. I wasn't even heated. I was quiet and calm, and I was trying to put forth my point of view. They were trying to put, it was a discussion. And then after I spoke, everybody in the audience started piping up. They didn't even ask for permission. They just started to talk. And it was a discussion. It was a lot of different viewpoints. A lot of people had things to say from their own viewpoints. But that's not what they want. That's what they call harassment, is a discussion. Harassment is anything that isn't them telling you what to think. And that should scare everyone. Um, uh, I don't even know if I answered your question. I'm sorry. No, you, you, actually, you actually did. And um, I'm sorry, I was in boss of what you were saying. I'm sorry. Um, on that note, though, um, we actually have some uh, recent news uh, in Canada, uh, 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 I think earlier last week, um, Justin Trudeau, um, I, I Trudeau. know his name, Trudeau. Um, Justin Trudeau uh, is now the new Canadian Prime Minister. But a couple of months ago, before he got elected, he mentioned um, that there needs to be a, a fight against Gamergate in some way, shape, or form. I don't have the exact quote on me, uh, but this brought a lot of concern because this was the first political leader of a political party of a country uh, speaking out against Gamergate, um, he made it very clear that he was a feminist, he believed in equal rights, and then he brought in Gamergate as a key issue. Um, and as someone from Canada, like we, uh, a lot of people are wondering, like, you know, your opinions on that and uh, how, if this is concerning in any way, shape, or form. Well, we can always hope that he's just playing to his, his constituency in pointing out Gamergate and saying that we are horrible people, um, you know it's 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 gonna it's it, to, uh, unfortunately this is what's going to happen. Um, people throughout history, regimes um, and and governments and nations have used this narrative of protecting women to 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 justify all kinds of atrocities. Um, and not particularly in the process, not really protect women either. But anyway, um, and because Gamergate, and, and now they're using this narrative to target a consumer, um, like a consumer advocacy group. I mean, it, it's basically society eating itself, I think. And I, I, you know what? I doubt he's really investigated it. I doubt he really knows what he's talking about. Uh, he's just playing it safe. I think, and hopefully he's just being a politician, and it's completely meaningless what he's saying. If it isn't, then I don't know. I, I guess I'll be the first one on the chopping block or imprisoned for Gamergate wrong speech or wrong think, because uh, <laughs> you know, 
uh, and also, uh, I mean, and Karen will be next, and then the rest of us in, who, who are Canadian Gamer Gators. <sighs> well, I guess we'll be the, we'll give you the first people to be sacrificed in the name of equality. Yay! Hopefully it doesn't come to that. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in free speech and uh, everything it stands for, and I'm really hoping it doesn't come to that. And, you know, as a journalist, it, it is a little bit of a fear on, like, how certain things are, are, uh, are happening. Um, slightly off topic, because uh, before, before we did this interview, I've edited on things we were talking about. But there's actually a college in America that has been talking about microaggressions and certain words that we should not be saying or using. And... Some of those words are completely understandable, but it also depends on the context. Um, but this is a little bit of a concern that now we're having this whole thing where people are saying you shouldn't say these words, you shouldn't say say those things, you shouldn't think those things, and you know it's affecting uh, creators like yourself, and it's affecting so many people in, in so many ways, shape, or form. Um, what would be, in your opinion, the best way to stand up against this? Um. Well. It's, 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 it's basically totalitarian. I think most people are now getting that this is, this is how totalitarianism is going to happen. And it's, it usually is. If you look at, for example, uh, uh, you know, um, we'll break Godwin's law. If you look at Nazi propaganda, a lot of it had to do with, with protect the Aryan women from the Jewish male sexual menace or, or Aryan children from Jewish pedophiles. And, and if you look at Jim Crow and all of the rhetoric around there, it was protect white women from black men, sexuality. Um, this, is, this, is, this is all the same thing. This is whenever somebody, whenever a group of people, racists, bigots, totalitarians, um, uh, genocidal regimes, want to justify doing some really atrocious <coughs> shit, they always reach for the same thing because it works. Protect the women. We need to protect the women. So this is, if, if we can manage this, we can probably do something. And this is, this is optimism. And you, fair enough, people will be like, oh, you're too optimistic. If we can actually challenge this bullshit and start saying, hey, we can't uncritically just protect the women. So look at what, what has happened in history. When we just swallow this propaganda, and start beating on groups of people to protect the women. It, it always goes bad. So maybe we should start thinking about holistically what's best, not just for women, but for men. And for also maybe, maybe we should stop creating these outgroups that we then justify hurting or silencing or killing. You know, maybe we should stop doing that. I think if we can actually change this narrative and say, hey, this narrative needs perspective. We could probably do something that we have never done in history, which is challenge the very roots of racism and bigotry. Because it all seems to start with, let's protect the women that, 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 that look like us. And then it just snowballs from there. Let's protect the women that think like us. And then it snowballs from there. And what's really funny is that the women that don't think like us, that don't look like us, also get caught up in the violence and the silencing and the censorship. So it really isn't about women. It isn't about protecting women. It's about drumming up this, this blood rage towards a group of people. And if we can finally get some perspective on that, maybe we can solve that problem that humans have about creating these outgroups and then treating them like crap. And it's like, this is, this is, and this is, this is a fight. What's really ironic is that these people, individuals are saying that they're fighting racism. They're fighting, uh, uh, they're fighting homophobia. They're fighting sexism. But it's this narrative, this narrative of protect the women that has been the greatest instrument of racism and homophobia and, and, and genocide. This is, the, this is the instrument of it. This narrative is the instrument of it. It's how it sets the stage. And I would also, agree, I would also argue that turning women into a fucking stable of helpless victims of, 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 I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, like nuclear fuel rod, a nuclear fuel for a fucking threat narrative of the, this narrative of, of victimhood. Turning women into fuel for that does them no favors either. So yeah, this is I, not, sorry, go ahead. 
No, it's, um, I'm actually inclined to uh, agree. And again, these are my opinions. These are not the opinions of game journalism networks. And uh, I always try to make that as clear as possible when expressing an opinion. It's just, you know, we were looking at a lot of uh, current situations that have been happening. Uh, for example, uh, you know, with the uh, UN's Women Commission, and they were making it that cyber violence, um, if you choose to believe that that's a real thing or not, that that's a debatable situation, that it only affected women. And, you know, there has been numerous cases where this is not the case. We have a lot of men who've been victims of cyber violence. There's been people who've been going online, showing these claims and, and you know, showing, you know, actual proof, audio, visually, and written proof. And again, the, these issues that are happening, there are issues on both sides. I, I, I firmly believe that, you know, there are men's issues that do affect men. There are women's issues that do primarily affect women, but there are human issues that we need to look into in both sides. Yeah. Well, and like I said, that this is not doing women any favors. Um, it's, it's stripping away women's personhood to focus on their victimhood. And, and it's, it's, it's sort of appalling. Um, if, you, if you really think about it, it's appalling. That, and turning women into fuel for these threat narratives, stripping away their personhood to focus on their victimhood so that their only purpose is to be a victim of these groups that these people want to target and destroy. And the funny thing is that every, the reason why we recognize racism, the reason why we recognize homophobia is because these groups have been hurt by the dominant pair, like the dominant society. Don't they realize that what they're doing is creating the same situation by hurting people who think differently. And this, and if you look at people who think differently, you're, you're, you're looking at people who have a different, maybe different brain structure, who are, in some ways are functionally different than the rest of society. And believe me, we have a history of persecution that's brutal. I mean, of all of the, the ways of persecuting people, persecuting people for thinking differently is the one with the least amount of controls because everybody thinks that you can force someone to think differently. So you see torture, you see brainwashing, um, and then you also see widespread killing for people who think differently, heretics throughout history. Um, the, the kind of shit that heretics, this is what we are, heretics have dealt with throughout history from the, the overarching society that is unbelievable. Like it's, it's a history of persecution that's every bit as problematic as, as racism, homophobia, and what they would consider sexism. It's every bit as problematic as that, is the persecution of people who think differently. So in the future, that may be recognized. They realize that, that they are creating persecution that may in itself be recognized as just as heinous as racism, because simply because we think differently. And it's like, they don't see that coming. Since we identify racism as a problem because of the persecution, because of the persecution of an identifiable group of people, they don't see that, that it's entirely possible in the future we will recognize the persecution of heretics like us as being a problem just as, as big. And, and how will they look in that future? How will the people doing this look? It's silencing us, censoring us, denying our platforms destroying our careers, trying to, 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 to silence us with, with erroneous gag orders, poisoning our reputations. How will that look in the future? Okay. Uh, all right. I'll get off my soapbox. There you go. It's okay. Um, we, got, we actually have a couple of minutes left. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about was um, uh, you being a men's right activist, because this is something that unfortunately uh, gets a bad rap. Um, and I've never even heard of men's rights, but to, to be honest, I've never heard of men's rights activism until I learned about, um, the Honey Badger Radio. Like, I never knew this was actually a thing. Um, and when you hear it at first, and, and I'll be honest with you, when you hear it at first, it sounds kind of almost parody, almost satire, satirically impossible. And then, you know, I started listening to what you guys were saying and, you know, started doing my own research on it. And you guys have brought up interesting points that, you know, men are getting, um, unfortunately, thrown under the bus, you know, for something that they may or may not be doing, or they are now the victim in some way, shape, or form. And we even look at uh, what Emma Watson said 
um, at, at the UN as well that, you know, feminism turned into, you know, women hating on men and you know, almost bullying type of manner. What, what brought you into the worlds of men's rights activism and, you know, your stance on it now, especially if everything's been going on with Gamergate and what you've noticed? Okay. Well, I could probably go through the concrete steps of my history, or maybe I can just give motivation. I really cannot stand the role of victim. I absolutely, the idea that I'm a victim because I'm a woman is repulsive to me. And I, I've always I, I've always been that way, and I think it might have been some of my upbringing, the fact that my father really focused me on how I can act to change the, my world and the world around me, as opposed to, to just being an, a victim and, and crying loudly for help. Um, so I just, I just, when feminists, and I originally thought I was a feminist because of equality, because the, 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 um, the idea of equality. But then I really started to listen to feminism and what they were actually doing. And I realized they were trying to force me in the role of victim. I mean, it, I, I, and I keep daring feminists, tell me some kind of feminism that doesn't present women as victims because they're women. And I couldn't stand that. I, I absolutely hate being pushed into the role of victim. Um, that's my personal motivation. And so I went out and I deconstructed being pushed into the role of victim. Because I feel like being pushed into the role of victim is forcing me to wear a weight and be gagged and bound. And I didn't want it. So I went out there and I said, well, is this for real? And I looked at the situation for men. And as, as I looked at the situation for men, I deconstructed all of that, that weight, all of that baggage that had been put on me because I was a woman. And let me tell you, it was liberating. Um, and so that was my personal, personal, that's, that is the personal, like the, the more emotional personal. I, I could go through, you know, what specific books I read, what forums I went to, but that was my motivation from the very start is that I didn't like the role that feminism wanted me to play. And I, I looked at it and I said, Does, is there any rational reason to play this role? And I found out that the answer is no. I don't fucking have to be a damsel. And to be quite honest, the role of protecting people, of going out and trying to make the world better by my having existed, not just for me or people that look like me, but people who don't, is it fits me better. I'd much rather a sword than a fainting couch. And so I'm question what feminism was giving me. And and that's how I got to men's rights. Okay. Um, we're actually going to open up. Uh, are you good for a quick Q and A with uh, some people in the chat? Uh, sure. Okay. Um, we I just started the uh, uh, chat now. If you have any questions uh, for Allison or myself or both of us, um, you can ask us on the uh, live chat on uh, YouTube. Uh, there should be uh, if, if you're watching this live. If you're not watching this live, sorry, Mr. Chance. Um, we do have some questions that we're going to ask out. Um, you can also ask us on Twitter. Uh, using the hashtag AskGJN, that's hashtag ASKGJN. Um, I'm going to do a quick look through the chat real quick, Allison, and you know, I'm not sure if you're seeing the chat live as well. I am um, seeing the chat. It's, it's, okay. it's sort of a slow chat, but yeah. So I was able to keep track of it a little bit once I found the, 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 uh, the YouTubes. Yeah. Well, you got some uh, interesting people... Uh, you're doing positive com positive comments towards you. Uh, we should replace everyone with Allison. <laughs> we should replace everyone with the oh god, no. <laughs> oh, and clone <laughs> Allison ASAP. <clears throat> um yeah. oh, you got a lot you got a lot of uh, fans going on here. Um uh, Trudeau, I keep on saying well, his name wrong. No, Trudeau's right. Okay. Oh, Trudeau's right. Um, someone said like he'll probably only get Trudeau. Well, Trudeau, Trudeau. Trudeau. Okay, that's easy. I'm <laughs> I'm not a political commentator, so I can't really uh I'll, I'll leave that job to Trevor Noah. Um, he'll get one term and totally f up, and then you'll get conservatives again. Uh, yeah, that's actually you know that brings up an interesting point. He's the first uh, liberal prime minister for Canada. Is that correct? 
Yes, he's. Uh, I don't know if he's the first liberal. I'm not actually really up on politics. I'm. I'm a little apolitical. Um, okay. it, it seems to me that it's mostly just a Punch and Judy show. Uh, but uh, I, I. Yeah, he's. He is a liberal prime minister. No, I don't think he's the first liberal prime minister. <laughs> I have my. I have my serious doubts on that. But uh, yeah, he's. He's replaced the conservatives. Which, incidentally. For those of you listening, conservatives in Canada, not like conservatives in the U.S. Probably they are more like moderates in the U.S. So it's not it's not really the same thing. Uh, the uh, the situation is now the conservatives are minority government and the the liberals are a majority government, which means that. Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how many seats the Liberals got. It may be that they can pass things without getting approval of the uh, of the um, of the of the Conservatives. The way that the ways it, ways it, the way it works is the the most vote that each party gets corresponds to seats. Um, right. or the, when they when they win ridings, it corresponds to seats, and uh, that gives them a vote. So it's not it's not a two party system. It's sort of a plurality. Uh, it's a little more complicated. Okay, um, we're we're good for probably two more questions. Um, uh, we actually got this on uh, three different fronts. Um, but could we get? Because some people did miss the live portion at the beginning. Is it possible to get a TLDR of your current lawsuit status? Okay, the TLDR is the Calgary Expo has responded. Uh, Calgary Expo International has responded. Said. We didn't do it, and if we did, we were right to. And um, so now we're sending them a a letter saying, "Well, who did it?" Because we know that you know. And uh, and then uh, then we'll go on from there. It's like this is not something that happens quick. <laughs> right. This is sort of a slow, uh, in <laughs> a slow, painful process. Um, they're going to try to throw up as many ro roadblocks as possible, which we then have to circumvent. And, uh, yeah, so that, that's about where we're at. Uh, we're going to have to try to circumvent their first roadblock and then move on from there. But if they do not respond to our letter explaining uh, who did it, um, since the, the evidence is in um, that they know, uh, the Calgary, Calgary and, um, Inter Expo International is the executive director is one Kendrick Fong, who is also the founder of Calgary Comics and Entertainment Expo, who is also the owner of the Calgary Expo website where the Calgary Comics and Entertainment Expo does business under, who is also listed as the director of events since the very beginning of the Calgary Expo. So he knows. Okay. And we need to we need to compel him to reveal. And I've been told by Harry Copico that if he doesn't, that's not going to look very good. So, and we, we've also said, you know, we don't want to sue people who are not responsible. Um, we don't want to make an inconvenience to your client. So please tell us who, who is responsible. Fair enough. Um, and last question is, uh, do you and the uh, Honey Badgers have any uh, anything upcoming in the coming weeks, uh, personal projects or Honey Badger related? Well, I've been playing with a project. Um, I'd like to actually create an app for people's phones or their pads, their uh, their iPads or surfaces, in which it, it helps people do argue against social justice warriors and feminists with facts and figures, and also presents uh, arguments and maybe maybe a simulator too, like a an a, a agro social justice warrior feminist argument simulator, so people can hone their skills. And and have uh, references on the go. What? At, as an application, I, I, I don't know that's immediately out of right field. And also, we want to update. Oh, oh, and we've created like a three D badger thing, which is awesome. Cool. That people can print and and mod. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna want to check that out. Um, okay. Um, uh, the, this has been Allison Tillman from the Honey Badgers Brigade, and uh, good uh, luck for the Demon, demon. Your Timon, I am so sorry, Timon. That's okay. Uh, we're everybody screwing up with names this week. John, don't worry, I, I mispronounce everything too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Allison Timon, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this has been Allison Timon from the Honey Badger Brigade. I'm Amber Bone. This has been Game Journalism Network. Thank you for joining us. 
Have a good day. Thanks.